Well, it's a remarkable episode in British political and media history. Uh, we're going to have a judge-led public inquiry to look at press standards, the hacking scandal and news of the world. Um, Parliament, I think, has had a wake-up call about its obligations to uh, citizens to make sure that their privacy is protected. But I think perhaps more importantly, uh, uh, when you actually look at how this story has emerged, how it's in the consciousness of the nation, you know, people have known about this wrongdoing for a number of years now. Um, there's only a, a very few journalists wrote the story. Nick Davis of The Guardian has been instrumental, but also people like Martin Hickman on The Independent. Very few other newspapers reported this story. I think it's only kept alive because of social media, groups of people on Facebook, on Twitter, um, trade unions using their social media platforms to talk about the message. So for me, it's a really interesting political lesson. It's a lesson for the unions as well, that if you want to get a message over that, it, that is not normally going to get column inches in a national newspaper, yeah. use social media. Tom, the next question I'd really like to ask is it goes to the, the heart of your, your answer, actually, the reluctance of media outlets to pursue this story as they've known, for it, known about it for a number of years. Would you like to share your views on why there's been such a reluctance on media outlets to pursue this story? Well, it's actually been... Mo the, the general belief is that when mobile phones became ubiquitous back in the 90s, when computers were in every home, most news groups, or certainly most newsrooms, were involved in some form of uh, breach of uh, the law with, when it came to hacking. Then there was an important court case in 2004 where a private investigator, Steve Whittemore, was convicted of breaching the Data Protection Act. Most news groups then cleaned, cleaned up their act, but it appears that News International carried on. Uh, however, the other newspapers didn't want to air the industry's dirty linen in their news pages and therefore didn't report the story as it emerged. You said that the, the reason why this story's been kept alive has been largely due to new social media because of the print industry in particular not wanting to touch the story. What are the, the advantages, do you think, of social media for trade unions, bearing in mind the difficulty on us being able to get a trade union message out there into the wider media? I think social media for trade unions are important on two counts. Firstly, it's a publishing platform that you own and it's very cheap. So branch level, national level, regional level, even individual trade unionists have the ability to get a message out there on the net. But perhaps more importantly for unions who believe in collective action, what does social media give you? It gives you at its most, at its purest level, the ability to form groups really quickly with low barriers to entry. entry. By that I mean, in the old days, I used to have a book a room, print a leaflet, distribute it, set up a telephone tree, remind everyone to come to the meeting, take some decisions, take the minutes, send it back round, it took hours to organise anything. You can do that in 10 minutes flat on Facebook now. It's an absolutely remarkable um, uh, ability for trade unions to come together really quickly. And we saw that with the boycott the news of the world, groups that formed up and down the country last week. As soon as the revelations about Millie Dowler came out, within 48 hours, 6,000 people joined a Facebook group. It's an immen immensely potent tool for trade unionists to use. The last question I would want to ask, Tom, is that what is your hopes for the wider integrity of journalism over the next couple of months after we go through this judicial process? What is your hopes for the wider journalistic industry? Well, I hope, you know, remember the vast majority of journalists in this country have um, entered the profession because they believe in truth and they want to get to the facts and they want to genuinely report on current affairs and what's going on in the world. So we need to restore, restore the pride in the industry. And if we can do, to do that, I think we need proprietors, editors, ministers and leaders of parties to come together to find a form of regulation for newspapers, probably self-regulated, but with some independent membership of the national body that really, at its heart, would mean that an editor could be obliged to put a matter right when a newspaper has either made a mistake or taken part in a wrongdoing. Excellent, and just to thank you once again, Tom, for everything you've done over the years, in fact, on this story and 
congratulations. Thanks. Well, look, thank you to Unite. They've given support when it's needed. It's really important. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.